Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. So, all right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. Hey, you're tuned in to another special edition of The Business Side of Music. Tonight is Dead Horse Discussions with our co-hosts, Melissa Cavallo. Welcome. Hello, hello. And Rick Cavallo, welcome. Welcome. The Dead Horse branding people are here tonight. And special guest across the table from me here, you and I have a mutual acquaintance. Yes, we, we will do. talk about him later. Yeah. Elliot Sloan, who is with us. If you don't know who he is, and you should... Blessed Union of Souls will probably familiarize yourself with Elliot, who started the band back in, well, let's see, you had your debut in 95, but the band started when? God, you know what? It's right in there, 89, 90, 91. I think officially, I'm going to say officially it started in 92 because that's when we came up with the name of the band and that's when we were working on the songs that were going to eventually be on the first album. But my guitar player and I, Jeff at the time, we had been in a cover band from like 89, 90, 91 when we were... Were you doing the club we were, route or...? We were, yeah, we were out of town. We were like in Virginia, Florida. That was the first time I went to Florida. I got to go in a band. And our first gig in Florida was Cocoa Beach for a month. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can do this. Oh, it was August Made though. It. So it was, I mean, it was like... 8.30 in the morning, it was already like 91 degrees, but I didn't care. And the humidity was up there too, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so. Where did you come up with the name Blessed Union of Souls? You don't know this? No, that I Are don't you serious? know. Yeah. Did you watch MASH growing up? I did. That's where I got it from. Okay. An episode of I MASH. Know, I watched MASH growing up, but I never saw that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? It was in the third season. There was an episode called House Arrest. And Frank Burns right. is the one that said it, who was one of my favorite characters because he was so quirky and he was always the butt of everybody's jokes. There was this lady colonel that was staying at the 407th 7th. And that wasn't Hot Lips Houlihan at the time. Well, no, she was there. Okay. No, no, that, that's the thing. This lady colonel from some other unit was okay. staying there and she had to stay in Hot Lips tent, which means Frank couldn't stay in Hot Lips ah. tent. And, you know, Frank's going crazy because, you know, 24 hours are going to go by and I'm not going to be able to see you or 48 or whatever. And he was like, is she going to stay here? Like, you know, is there any other place that she could stay? I'm paraphrasing. And she was like, no, it's the only place in officer's country because she was a colonel and a doctor. But he said, and he said, well, Margaret, I need our togetherness. I need the blessed union of our souls. Wow. wow. That's cool. Are you sure it wasn't blessed union of assholes? <laughs> you know what? Let me rewind that to make sure. It was an Australian thing, I mean. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so that stuck, and there was the name. Well, yeah, and that was, God, that was a year and a half when I saw that episode. Actually, I'd seen it way before that, before we started working on the music for the first album. Right. And when we did, you know, we had Let Me Be The One written, we had I Believe written, and we still had no band name. And I remembered that. I was like, what do you guys think of this name? And everybody was cool with it. Because it just kind of fit, you know. Fit everyone. Yeah. Usually, coming up with band names, though, you guys work with a lot of bands. Band. Oh yeah, it's a, that's that's you know. I don't know if I like that. Like Let's try this. Teeth. Yeah, and you know, and then it comes in some names. I don't know. I don't know how like the name U two came together, which I think is very cool. Third Eye Blind, very cool. Google Dolls, Third. Eye. Some names are just like yeah, Coldplay. I'm like, what is that? But that's cool. <laughs> but I, I think it's when when you think of come up with the branding yourself. It's like imagine going, 
we're in a band right now. We go, what about Pearl Jam? Like, that's stupid. But when you hear Eddie Vedder or someone say, like, it's like, oh, wow, that's so cool. Yeah. But when it's your own name, it's like, uh, I don't know if I like it. Yeah. Overthink it. Overthink you know? it. Yeah. I had a band back in the day. We did the club circuit out in California that we called ourselves the Della Street Band. And everybody was like going, oh, I had an aunt named Della Street. And I'm like, no, you didn't. No, I know the name. <laughs> if you ever watched Perry Mason, that was his secretary was Della Street. Della Street. Oh, and that's how that's they came cool. up with the name. There was a band in our hometown, and I don't know if they've done this in the US, probably. They were called Free Beer. And in the front of the sign at the marquee, it's like, Free Beer tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone would be like, coming for the show, it's and it's clever. like, where's the beer? You know? yeah. So that's that's what their name was. Hey, that's so they got to fill in. a place. That's oh, the yeah. way to fill up a place. So you guys got together. Who was the original guy to start figuring out that you could write these songs? Was it a was it a collective group or it was it was Jeff and I, yeah. Jeff Pence and myself, because he and I, it was him and I were on in this cover band, like I said. And while we were on the road during the day, when the rest of the band is sleeping till four o'clock, we're getting up at eleven. You know, he brought some of his equipment on the road, and we're in the other room tracking just just to see what we can come up with. None of it was good. None of it, <laughs> nobody ever heard. But you know what I mean? You got to get through that. It's like, you know, I always equate it to like the scene of Shawshank Redemption, where the guy has to crawl through all that mud <laughs> just to get to the to the good part. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, you got to write, well, not got to, but you know, a lot of times you have to write, do a lot of, you got to make a lot of mistakes, and you got to write a lot of bad songs, and have somebody in your corner to tell you that they are actually bad and improve on that and don't get your feelings hurt and go, okay, I thought that was really good, but now I see that it wasn't. So when you first started putting the album together, did you have the record deal in place before the album? No, no, we were making demos. Yeah, we had no idea. And this was back in the day that you could actually make a demo CD and send it to record labels and they'll actually open it and listen Mm. to it. You know what I mean? We just had confidence in the songs that we were coming up with we did like six or seven songs we picked four and we're like okay we're gonna shop this and see what happens yeah and then the band started working in the studio you got the record deal Mm -hmm. you started working in the studio was that a moment of you already knew all the songs they were all put together it was finished or were you spending some time developing them in the studio as you were recording well the thing is yeah both because all the songs weren't written we were writing songs as the record was being made yeah which was always good because now you can see that light at the end of the tunnel there's a record company that wants to put out your record we have the first single that we knew it was probably going to be i believe possibly the second single but you know now that you know that songs are getting ready to actually see the light of day, yeah. then you start crafting better and you start trimming the fat. You're like, you know, th- those songs that I thought that was really good, I know I know that's not good because now we have a standard. Now we have a benchmark. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, these songs are where we have our sound and that's so important. A lot of a lot of artists, they may have a good song but they don't always have a great sound. You can have the one good song or two good songs or whatever, but we had a, a sound and it was like a big giant bucket of things that we could throw into it because we had we were writing like crazy. Yeah, like I said, we saw the light at the end of the tunnel. So once the label signed us, we just kept writing and kept writing and kept writing until we were just like, okay, I think we've 32 songs. I think that's enough. You had 32 songs. Yeah, <laughs> so we, wow. can, wow. we, can, we can pick from there. I love the story of Elliot, um, and you, you can speak it, speak about it now, but I believe is a song that I remember when it came out in Australia. The story that Elliot tells is that the record label didn't believe in that, and they believed in it so much, and that it filled them fill in. Oh, sure, sure. This is after we have the deal. Recorded, mixed, and mastered. It's all there. And the record company was going through all these changes. This is 93, then 94. By 1994, we couldn't even get them on the phone. <laughs> it's just like, and I don't think they were being, you know, crappy to us. They were just like, we don't know what to do with this band. We don't know how to market them. Are they pop? Are they R and B? Are they indie? Are they? Fo-? And it was just, you know, how we talked about earlier, mm. overthinking. It, they were overthinking it. You know, it, it, and that's so important, especially as an artist, and just in this whole genre. You gotta, if you can just remember how you felt, you know, when you heard it or when you saw it. We were like, look, this is our career. We need to do something. So my manager just printed up CDs and sent it out to radio stations. 
-hmm. And we were like, I don't care what the record label's doing. We really felt like the song was strong enough. And he sent it out to a a few stations. He sent it to Jimmy Steele, who was a Q102 in Cincinnati. He was the music director. I'm sorry, the program director. And Brian Douglas was the music director. And we had already had a pretty good relationship with them. And but he wasn't going to just play the song just because we're from Cincinnati. I mean, Jimmy Steele's hardcore. But he's also like, if he takes it on, then you know what's good. That's what you need. That's what you want. You know, there's people in your corner that you're talking about. like Exactly. And you got to have that. Yeah. You know how that is. You yeah. got to have people in your corner. You know, you can't just play a bunch of songs for your friends and parents and go, oh, that's great. And no, it's not great. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's not. Mm-hmm. It sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Get somebody in your corner that tells you the truth. And Jimmy was one of those guys that, was, that told you the truth. He listened to it. He's like, this song is a hit. And I don't care what the record, record companies do. We're playing it. Walk blindly to the light and reach out for his hand. Don't ask any questions and don't try to understand. Open up your mind and then open up your heart. And you He started playing it in Q102, and he started playing it like, you know, once a day. He couldn't just blast it out. Just once a day. See if phone calls were coming in, phone calls were coming in, phone calls were coming in. Then it was like twice a day. Then it's like 10 times a week. So he calls his friend up over at KKRZ in Portland, Oregon. And like I said, Jimmy was, and he still is, very well respected. If Jimmy still calls you up and says, I've got a hit record, you should be playing this, then that guy's going to move a record out of the way and start playing this record. You know, it's like Don Corleone. I think you should play this record. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> okay, I'll do it. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good but, analogy. But, but yeah, but uh, so it started playing in Portland, Oregon. For you know, a QAL, Cleveland started playing. Then WHOT and Youngstown started playing it. And G- GTZ and Dayton started playing it. And we finally got the record company's like attention. Like, can you at least... Put a single out. Mm-hmm. Just make a cassette. It was a cassette. <laughs> yeah. The cassette. Just, just put Ka-single. it out and <laughs> just see a cassette. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, "All right, all right." So we talked him into putting a cassette single out in the record stores. Two words that you don't hear anymore: cassette and record stores. Right. <laughs> And we put them in record stores around Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky. And of course, you know, the first week, you know what I mean? You know, all of our family and friends were like, yeah, we're going to buy it. Even our record company was like, because it sold like 167 pieces the first week. And, and the guy at the label was like, okay, now that all your family and friends bought it, let's see if we have a real record. Right. Then right. the week after that, it was 210, 285, 367, 514. They probably, they just gave up. They said, okay, fine, we'll put your album out. Like we had to. We had to talk them into a number one record. You know you, what I mean? You had to make you had to make them do it. You had to make like, them do it. I had to make them do it. I know. That story of a record label now, not record label, a radio station, you know, breaking a song like that, you don't really hear that anymore. No. No. Um, it's usually the social media kids passing on to their friends and it it's interesting because the way you describe it was a very organic Mm. inception and growth yeah. without the record label driving 
very yeah, little of that. Pretty much. Initially, those first, you know, six to eight weeks, it pretty much was, you know what I mean? And, you know, we weren't a band that was out playing around a lot. I mean, we were built from the studio, but the way that record started in and of itself was just the response from the fans and how it made them feel. You know what I mean? Yeah. That yeah, that thing that right there, pull, that, I've yeah. got to hear that again. And that's yep. to me, you that's know? the power of a good song. A great, yeah. Sorry, a great song. A great song, yes. Because yes. they pump out shitty music, like they'll pump it like 20 times a day, they'll play it, and then you just get it stuck in your head because it's a shitty song and you're sick of hearing it. Right. But a song like I then Believe, it. it just, yeah. Yeah. Well, like you said, organically just spreads it and it, it just mm -hmm. holds you and, and it's still going today, like yes. 25 years later. I know. I and know. I, I think the thing there too is, it doesn't grow so fast that it burns rather quickly. Now mm -hmm. you have a life and it's staying out there for a while. Sure. And with that happening, were you starting to see dates coming in? How, how did that all come about that, okay, wait a minute, we have a hit, now we have to get out and perform, we have to tour. Did you have that in place at that point? Or did all of a sudden you go, oh, wait a second, I, I, I've got to do something. I was, <laughs> I was out with Lisa Lisa and the Colt Jam back in 87. And we were basically playing clubs and, and small venues. Right. And all of a sudden their first hit took off. And it was like in a week we're on the phone calling sound companies going, we've changed venues. We're now at a theater. <laughs> and we need more sound and more lights. And then it was like, we've changed venues. <laughs> We're now in an arena. We need more. Did, did that That's kind of happen? Or there, right? How long did it? Uh, well, was it, it a slow off, burn for you guys? Or? Yeah, somewhat because it was still, you know, we, we were a radio based band. So a lot of radio stations were like, you know, hey, we're having this concert you know come play it so we started doing a lot of radio shows and in between that we brown got a bag book. lunches as we used to call them yeah, yeah. there you go yeah. and then in between that we got i think it was william, william moore no famous artists and then william moore's had a few different booking agents but here's the thing even with the number one record and even after the second single uh went in the top 10 we were not an easy band to book we were we've never been an easy band to book it's like i i, I don't know I've stopped trying to figure it out, but you know, we'll play one show where, you know, it's like two, 3000 people. And the next show there's like 150 and it just depends on the market. I don't know. All I know is we just go out and play. We're going to take a break here, get a word in from one of our other sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to have some more conversation here with Elliot Sloan talking about blessed union of soul along with Rick and Melissa Caballo from dead horse branding. You're listening to the business side of music. Hi everyone, I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook, 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right, everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena, and believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics, all written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it, and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler, and I approve of this message. Thanks. Are you curious about Gordon Lightfoot's songwriting process or what it was like working with Prince in the 80s? Have you ever given any thought to what goes into a golf course design or writing a book? I'm Steve Waxman, the host of The Creationist, a podcast about people who create. Each episode features a different creator sharing stories that I hope will inspire your own creativity. The Creationist is available now on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to the business side of music. Didn't you guys blow up really quick that you guys were landing in another country doing an interview in Japan or something and flying out? Yeah, we were doing a lot of stuff towards the end of 95 when the album came out in early 96. We'd go to Germany and never leave the airport. We'd go to Germany and there'd be like five guys from different media outlets doing interviews. It was like one after another, one after another. You know, we landed at 1115. 
and our flight we're leaving at 115 but in between that there's five interviews and then we'd go for, you know from Stuttgart wow. you know to Baden Baden and from Baden Baden you know we go to Berlin and then sometimes we'd actually get out of the airport and then go <laughs> go stay and go to a wow. radio station and something like that but yeah it was just a lot of that just planting wow. we we're planting a lot of seeds you know and yeah. went to Amsterdam but we did uh, in, in 96 we ended up we did get on a tour with Mike and the Mechanics we don't know you remember right we toured with them all through March and April through England and Scotland and Wales and that was really good for us because we had a lot of fans over there that we never made it to Australia oh well I mean well, yeah, your music, your music did. did I know, <laughs> I know. Music. Goodness, hey, it's not Kurt. too late it's not it's not I, I kind of feel like you guys and Hootie, Hootie and the Blowfish were in that same, your own genre almost. You know what I mean? Like sure. you were saying before, yeah. it's like you can't place these guys, but you sort of like the two of you guys were similar and not similar sound, but similar in mm-hmm. how do you package these mm-hmm. bands? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they got their big break came on David Letterman. And when they got on David Letterman, David Letterman gave them such a big endorsement. And God love them, they deserved it too because they had some really good songs and a good band. Once that happened, it was just like, boom. Did the same thing with Counting Crows. I remember that. David Letterman. We were trying to get on there, too. Like, I don't know. It's been, a, it's been a crazy, interesting, humbling ride for the last 25 years. And still, sometimes I, I just drive past my old house in Cincinnati. And, you know, I, I, you know the records, the records that, that record store is still there. Everybody's records really? is right up the street. Cause, because they sell vinyl. They, they're, they're vent, they don't just sell records. They, they, it's, it's like a vintage record store. But I go by there and all the time just to remember where I came from and how it all started. And I see the house and there's a side on the, on the house, there's a separate part of the house that was a solarium with the music room. Had my piano oh, wow. and my sound system. I used to play all my Led Zeppelin and Queen records and stuff like That's that. Cool. Let's jump back to that for a minute. What were your musical influences growing up? I was infatuated with Robert Plant. Robert Plant, Freddie Mercury, and Prince. <laughs> and then Elton John, and then Billy Joel, and then Stevie Wonder, Black Sabbath. Wow. Yeah, and then I like Pink Floyd, I like Thin Lizzy, I like Robin Trower. I love the cars, mm. you know, mm. yes. Um, you had a very eclectic taste yeah. in music. Yeah, and for a black guy living, a, a black kid living in a in an all-white neighborhood, going to an all-white school, everybody thought I was just nuts. It was just like, what are you listening to? <laughs> it's like, what are you listening to? They're listening to Rapper's Delight, and I'm like, yeah. you know, want to throw up. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, putting on Houses of the Holy, you know, <laughs> and presents. And they just didn't get it. And I don't know why I got it. I don't know. You know what I mean? When you when I look back and I didn't think about it, it's, it's like, I play this, I like it. I play this, I love it. And I go towards that. And I don't know. I don't even care why. It's just like, that's just what I was drawn to. Let's back up even a little further. As a kid growing up, were you in a musical family? What What was the attraction for you? And my mother put me, Clovia, Doris, and Teddy, and myself, and my mom, all five of us, started taking piano lessons when I was like six or seven. And it wasn't a discussion. It was, you know, mom was old school. It was like, you know, we're eating dinner. Oh, by the way, tomorrow, piano lessons. All of you, then back to eating. It was just like, <laughs> okay, we're taking piano lessons. That, that's as far, that, that's what I remember. It wasn't wow. a question. They didn't sit down and have a family discussion. Why, why do you think she wanted you to do it though? I don't know. She, she was. Come. I think she just. I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember. Maybe there was a piano in her house growing up or something. But she just. I don't know. I think she okay. just liked just the, liked the piano and yeah. she wanted. I don't know. I think she was as a mom. She was just opening doors. You know what I mean? Sure. And then you know how it is. Your, your parents should try to. Do you like this? Do you like this? Like yeah. my, my daughter right now, my 15-year-old, you know, we had her in piano lessons. She liked it for a little bit, but then she got out. And we had her in violin for a little bit. She liked a little bit and then got out. Put her in swimming. She's like, yes, this is what I'm doing. So she's a competitive swimmer. And wow. so was my kid, my 11-year-old. Hmm. But, you know, she was just opening up doors for us. And one by one, every we all went every Saturday morning ten from 10 to like 2 o'clock because everybody got 30 minutes or whatever. And one by one, you know, my sister dropped out, and then my other sister dropped out. And my, but I, you know, I, I liked it. I got it. I couldn't read the music. I didn't tell her that. And <laughs> But I just I just liked it. I don't know. And I was listening to music, and I was trying to play those songs on the piano. I was so angry. Oh, I'll never forget. I almost lost my temper because I couldn't sing this song by Elton John 
It was a uh, candle in the wind. My my voice wasn't deep enough. Really? <laughs> I couldn't hit now. the notes. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't now. hit the notes. I remember like, Argh! why can't I hit the notes? You know what I mean? But I, was, I didn't even know I was songwriting back then. I thought I was just making up songs. You know what I mean? I thought songwriting was, you know, get a piece, you know, write out the notes. So I mm. wrote a song and it took me about a year <laughs> to write it. And it wasn't even correct. Because I'm That's like, oh, this looks like, let's make this one of the black notes. Oh, that's enough black notes for a while. Let's make this one white. Oh, there's one of those staff things on there. Let's put one of those on there. <laughs> if somebody would have put that in front of him and actually played it, they were like, what is this? Ding, it's, ding, it's a ding, song. Ding. Play it. Okay. Okay. Here's what you wrote. Exactly. That's not it. You know what I mean? But, you know, I was making up songs and I found out later that that's considered songwriting. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Because <laughs> that I'm wasn't not... for you. That was not your thing. Right. That was not your thing. <laughs> Were you more of a lyricist? than uh, the actual melody or, or music part of it, or was it both? Uh, it probably started more with the music and then humming melodies over top of it. Because when you try to describe a song to somebody and you don't know the words, what do you do? You hum the melody, you know? You, you just give me, you know, da 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 Oh, California girl. Yeah, that's it. I wish I did that. <laughs> you don't want to hear me A lot of people do, to... and you go, yeah, <laughs> please stop. I, right, try, right. I just try to sing it. I, I talk it. I'm that bad. I'm like, you know, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. I think, yeah, you know, they should sell an auto-tune app. You know what I mean? Just oh. right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Let me get my app out. I'll right. tell you what I'm thinking. So, so given that you're a black guy in a white community with a pretty much white ba uh, white band, right? Yeah. Does yeah. Uh, is you, was any other black Latino or in the band, or was it just white? Uh, me and Eddie were the only two black guys. Charlie is as white as they get. Yes, he is. So, <laughs> for those that don't know, Charlie Roth, C.P. Roth, we hope he's watching tonight. If he's not, we're gonna, you and I are going to beat up on him later. Oh, so yeah. so how, like, what was the driving force of writing the song? Did you come up with a vibe like that? Because the sound is, like you say, your, your sound is very, um, it's rock, it's pop, it's soul. And you've got all these influences from Led Zeppelin and you know, the Yes and, and bands like that. So what was the driving force of getting your, you guys that unique sound that you got? Was it you on the piano and humming the songs or was it the white band bringing their juice? It was both because all the stuff that I was into, Jeff kind of liked that stuff, but all the stuff that he was into, which was like Leonard Skinner and ZZ Top, I kind of liked that too. I could relate to that. You know, it wasn't so foreign to me like, oh dude, that's not gonna work. But we kind of meshed it together and the, the catalyst in the middle that meshed it together was our producer, Emoja, young kid out of Brooklyn, I say young kid because he was a few years younger than me. Because he had, he had just recorded his album that was produced by P.M. Don, Prince B from P.M. Don. So he basically, he took Jeff, he took Elliot, and helped bring it to there. And Charlie did the fine tuning, put the beautiful layers of strings and sounds on top. And I was just like, it's, this is like a great dream. You know, if you have those great dreams you don't want to wake up from. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's all. That was 1992, 93, 94, 95. It was just like, wow. is this really happening? You know what I mean? Everybody dreams about that. A musician dreams about. That's all I was. Man, you, man, I wanted. I, I, man, I gotta have this song on the radio. I know these songs on the radio. I want to have songs on the radio. And it's, it's that's way out there. But I was naive enough to believe that it could actually happen. All of us were. It's good that we didn't know everything there was to know about the music business because we were just dumb enough to believe, yeah, we can make up some music and get on the radio. You did. You just did. Yeah, you did. You know what I mean? And then people were like, man, how did you do that? I'm like, I don't know. We wrote some songs. I got with this guy. We got with this guy. We got a manager. We boom. And it just came together. And everybody was just open. Everybody was just like, yeah, we have a sound. We have, we, you know, it, it started like this. You know what I mean? Elliot and Jeff with our music and our musical influences and then matt brought it like that and then charlie brought it closer and you know what i mean once you get mm. that you know how it is mm -hmm. you had the perfect union we had the perfect <laughs> <blessing>. <laughs> yeah. nice that's yeah. right well, and you were branding and formulizing formularizing i like that i don't word formulating <laughs> formulating there you go i like your we'll, version we'll pretend it's an australian <laughs> word <laughs> there you go. it is a word it's like a single <laughs> like <Kasingle. laughs> Which one of us needs to get that trademark yeah, before the like night's a, over? Yeah, like a single. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. single. Um, but you were basically building yourself and, and going through the formulas of 
of the music business um, without knowing it. Without knowing it. Without knowing it. Because today, you know, it's the same thing. Someone comes to us, it's like they're, they're, they're brand new, they've got some ideas, they've got some songs. It's like, all right, we need to shape it more. It needs more of a sound. What's your sound? Okay, hook you up with the best players. Not even the best, but players that suit you. Right. Okay, need a producer. Um, you know, okay, are we going to have a label who's managing you? Like, you did everything. And then same thing today. Label's not really maybe putting enough effort behind you. They're not really getting it. Great. Yeah. Got to go underdog style. Like, right. what are we doing? Yeah. Except today, it's more PR focused to hit yes. more of the streaming and the playlist as opposed to sending out albums to the radio stations. Yes. No, you're so right. So you really were you were branding it and you didn't know it. We didn't even know it. And, and I'm and I look. I'm not trying to throw stones at our marketing department at, at the label, but they were just. What do we do? They were still like, what do we do? What do we do with these guys? I mean, again, what genre do we put? When people ask us, all I, can, all I can tell them is that like, well, in the record store, it's under pop. But then I've also seen it under R&B. And then some yeah. people thought we were all for one. Remember them? Yes. You know yeah. what I mean? Oh, really? it, we oh would, yeah. 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 That's why it was just like, I mean, certain bands you think of, boom, Rolling Stones, you got to think about that. You too, you don't have to think about it. Third Eye Blind, you don't have to think about it. You know, but and Blessing Your Souls, what song is it? Oh, yeah, they got that one song. You know, as soon as they got to say that, you know. You but looking, looking back, mm -hmm. do you know if you were in this spot again with the knowledge that you have and working with that marketing department, do you know how, to, how you would position you and the guys back then? Me personally? Yeah, like do you see the disconnect that – do you have the answer for that back then or are you still like, no. you know what, I just don't know if we could – like I'm, I'm still not sure where we would have positioned. <laughs> That's why I'm going to hire you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to write the songs. But, but, but seriously, I just – you know, that's – you know, a lot, a lot of artists, they have that. They see all that. Mm -hmm. I see the music. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And, and that's I, okay. And I see and the stage and I hear yep. the songs and I can do that. I can – inject my my opinion but i once it's laid out for you you once can it's say, laid out yeah I'm, I'm good at i'm good at coming up with ideas after you've already come up with it <laughs> <laughs> like what i do yeah that's Rick. great i take credit for everything he comes up with that's I like that. <laughs> but, I, but i mean someone like like you guys you, you come up with a song like i believe that's that's deep meaningful you know, it's a solid song. And then you come out with some fun and poppy like Hey Leonardo and it's like, right. holy crap. Oh, that confused a lot of people. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Do you think that was detrimental? I, I don't, you know what? Again, it might have been. I don't think about that stuff. Just like I didn't look at the questions. <laughs> I'm like that, man. You know what I'm saying? I, I, it's like, I got this groove in my, I, boom, boom, boom. Like this dun, dun, dun. This is going to be cool. This is going to be cool. Let's record it. We record it and then just to see what happens. Because if you start thinking, well, is it going to be detrimental? Well, I don't know if we're going to get this. Well, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't yeah. question a lot of things when it comes to that because I think if it just if it if it, if it feels good, if it feels good, then let's just see what happens. Uh, there, when we sent it to radio, <laughs> radio stations were calling us like, Mark, my manager is calling him like, okay, hey man, I just got this song. Um, this is Blessed Union. Yeah, this is Blessed Union. Okay, well, well, who's singing the song? Well, that's Elliot singing it. That's Elliot? Yeah. Okay. Well, who wrote the song? Well, Elliot and the guys wrote it. It was just, you know what I mean? There was a it's, disconnect for them. Right. There it's was, like, yeah. It's like writing, you know, you know, I get around War Pigs by Black, <laughs> by Black Sabbath. You know what I mean? It's the same band. You know, it's not, yeah. but I'm just saying. I yeah. The yeah. same band wrote that. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think what happens, though, is over time, like John Lennon writes Imagine, but he can still write other fun songs as well. But right. you guys were just... Boom, that's this, and then boom, the other yeah. side of the right scale. In the same, so there was yeah. no time to really get to know you guys. Yeah, well, luckily, that, yeah, well, that, was, that was on the third album. So even still, I mean, I don't know. The second album was kind of, yeah, well, here's the thing about it. Because the second album, we came out with I Want to Be There, which could have fit perfectly on the first album. Then Lighten Your Eyes was the next single after that. But the thing about that is, like, three weeks into the promotion of our first single for the second album, the record company goes out of business. So it, it's just like somebody just, just mm -hmm. and then we had to restart that back up when we got on mm. transferred to another label. And then, like you said, before you know it, Haley and Ardo's out. Oh, it must be a new band. No, it's the same band. It's, I don't know. It's bizarre. It was a big song, though. It was a big song. And again, I'll, I'll in Australia, 
Yeah, that's really, the one really that would big. go. That's the one. I, I have a gold plaque. Did I, did I send you a, I'm going to send you a picture no, of that. Send me a picture. I'll send yeah. you a picture of my gold plaque Definitely. Uh, from Australia. We're going to take a break here, get a word in from one of our other sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to have some more conversation here with Elliot Sloan talking about Blessed Union of Soul, along with Rick and Melissa Caballo from Dead Horse Branding. You're listening to the business side of music. My name is Garrett Hope. I am a composer, coach, podcaster, and speaker. I've been focused on building my music business since the early 2000s and helping others build their music businesses since 2015. I want to tell you about a free event I'm organizing for January. It's called the Ultimate Music Business Summit. It'll take place January 7, 8, and 9. Here's the deal. Through the summit, I want to help you build your own stimulus package for 2021. There will be over 21 teachers giving over 21 high-leverage business lessons you can use in your music business immediately so you can make 2021 the best year for your music ever. If you want to make more money with your music, grow your audience, or impact more people, this summit is for you. More than that, there will be a few live panel discussions so we can discuss this in real time. It's going to be amazing. And yes, it's free. This summit will give you real world, not theoretical, strategies you can implement immediately. I promise you, With all the teachers lined up, you'll get something you've never thought of before. Even though building a business is hard, and trust me, no one is promising it's easy. It is possible. You just need the right tools and strategies. Get your free ticket today and reserve your spot in the summit. Build your own stimulus package for 2021. I look forward to seeing you at the summit. Go to musicsummit.biz, that's musicsummit.biz, to get your ticket today. You're listening to the business side of music. You got on the road and you toured. One of the things I read in your bio is you were in all 50 states more than once. Yeah. You went all over yeah. Europe. How were the crowds when when you first got out there? And you've been doing this for 25 years now. Yeah, yeah, with this band. How were the crowds? Were they the same in every market? Were they receptive? Or were they trying to figure out who you were? Or was it kind of like everybody was a plight applause in the beginning and then the end it just was this raucous approval? Or what was it like out there? Well, we did get a, we did get a lot of uh, play on VH1 at the time. So people kind of recognized me because uh, I had the dreadlocks or whatever. So we did have that, but not everybody. But I think a lot of people came us because they were just curious. They'd heard the song. Who's this guy that can right. say that word, you know, in this song and get away with it? And I want to see what he looks like. And if I haven't seen him, whatever. And it's like, OK, I get it now. I remember one guy from Atlanta Records, Atlantic Records. I'll get back to the story. He called my manager at the time when we were shopping demos. And he goes, I love this song, but just please, please tell me this guy's black. <laughs> 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 if you can't hear that song. Uh, yeah. Okay, right. goodness gracious. Cause, but anyway. But yeah, the crowds were pretty receptive. It was a lot of curiosity. Yeah. Uh, the biggest problem we had was this, the whole album. There was probably only two up-tempo songs. And we didn't, we didn't think about that. You know what I mean? It's like, wow, we, you know, the whole, the whole concert, the whole hour show is going to be mid-tempo slow in a couple. So we had to oh, insert yeah. some covers that we liked, which was fine or whatever. We had the crowds were especially the ones I was into, especially in a lot of the small towns. We played every nook and cranny of small towns, Seymour, Indiana, you know what I mean? Uh, Lima, Ohio, Youngstown, Ohio, which is kind of, not a time, but you know, it's a decent sized town. I had a tour bus breakdown in, in Seymour, Indiana once. So. <laughs> Seymour, Indiana, yeah. see, there you, know, there you go. Yeah. yeah, we played, and it's- But you gotta do that, right? You gotta build it. It wasn't you like need yeah. those. in front of like a cornfield somewhere. Like at <laughs> yeah, night. state fairs, I'm telling yeah, you. Yeah, those, those county fairs and state fairs, those were the thing back then, yeah. yeah. It was the bigger cities that are used to having shows every night, every week, you know what I mean? That were kind of like, eh, they're okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, when, but when you get into those smaller secondary and tertiary markets, they really embrace you because yes. you're bringing a, a breath of fresh air to them. Uh, Pre- Prestonburg, Kentucky, 
Oh, my goodness. Ashland, Ohio, Ironton, Cold Grove, Ohio. I mean, just they're so appreciative that yeah. somebody's coming there. Right? Do you have you know what I mean? yeah. one gig over another that sticks in your mind that was just like, this was so cool. I'll go back and do this one anytime. Hmm, there were a few of those shows. Oh, man. Goodness gracious. I was with a band and we were playing in Mineral Wells, West Virginia at a county fair. And they had a rodeo. And I don't remember if we went on before the rodeo or after the rodeo, but they put us on two flatbeds and they brought the flatbeds in from opposite directions and buttoned them up. And we did the show. And then as we were doing the last song, they pulled the flatbeds away. But the people were so cool. <laughs> we'll go back. And the motel, the closest motel is like 40 miles away. You yeah, know? of course. So of we're course. just, we're all camping they, out. They've probably the never place. seen a lighter before. Look at this fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God! Yeah, oh, man. but those those kind of towns. I mean, did you did you have one that kind of stuck in your mind that you went? Well, I'll tell you what. The first really really like huge show that we did was in Lima. I mean, they promoted that for like three, probably a month, month and a half. And when we got there, I mean, talking about excited, we played at this theater. I remember that. I still have pictures from it. And uh, it Where's was that? Lima, Ohio, north, oh, okay. way up north. Yep, well, yep. no, no, no. It's not way up north. It's up and over. It's in the middle over there someplace. It's in Ohio. Okay. Yeah. But it's not a big town, a few thousand people, but everybody was there, packed into the theater. And the the radio station up there, they, I mean, they were blaring our music like six times a day. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was great. So, yeah, that kind of really sticks out because, I don't know, it, as a band, you write songs and, you know, you think they're pretty good or whatever, and they get on the radio. But when the fans come see you and you can see their genuine up close reaction then you know it's real and you know it it really hit home with somebody that show really kind of gave us that you know legs to con continue i mean we were going to do it anyway but it was like okay yeah this 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 is really good it works when things finally started to slow down for you mm -hmm. was the record deal was it everything that you thought it was going to be do you it <laughs> He's thinking. I like that. I'm not thinking. He's trying, to, he's trying he's to be diplomatic. <laughs> yeah. He's trying to be diplomatic. Hey, listen, unless you're looking for a new one, let's just, what What was it like? I mean, was it what you thought it was going to be? Well, you know. Because you said you couldn't get him to return phone calls. You couldn't get him to call back. And, and, I'm, and I come friend. from the label side <laughs> where I remember the artists going, you know, why isn't anybody calling me back? It wasn't Bob, was it? Bob's no. Like, oh, it's Elliot. <laughs> I, I, that. I was Hello? actually one of the few guys that did call back. So it's not a record company. <laughs> you got number. a wrong number. <laughs> you go now. You All you go can now. eat. Yeah. <laughs> no. No, look, I, and I understand it. It's business. I get it. You know, they you're, you're a label, you've got 30 acts. You know, two of them are making you money. <laughs> yeah. you know and they're I mean? feeding the other 28. And they're feeding yeah. the other feeding 28. 28. Yeah. But once, you know, things started happening to us, yeah, I mean, they were excited that we were there. And I think genuinely, but also, they're a business. They got to keep the lights on. I get it. What was your question? I've got ADD. What, did you, what just when, happened? Yeah, well, that's that's a problem because so do I. He's got dementia. <laughs> yeah, oh, ADD. Oh, 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 was, was, was it everything that we forgot? Expect, yeah. I'll, I'll help you guys <laughs> yeah. with the expectations. Well, yeah, was Thank the you. record label deal? Uh, yeah. yeah, it was. It was exciting. It was a shiny new car, you know, until it gets about a hundred thousand miles on it. You know what I mean? And you start like, oh man, I didn't know that was there. You know what I mean? Or I didn't know it had made this noise. Whatever. It was great. It really was. We were excited. They were excited to have us there. Five guys in a band, artistic, creative. We want to try everything. And a record label's, yeah, we can try this, but I don't know about this. And we're like, why can't we just do everything? You know, because it costs 800 grand. That's why. Right. You know right. I mean? yeah. But on a business side, though, if, if you were signed... You did pretty much have to put up, uh, create your own fire mm -hmm. to create attention to the label that you were signed to for them to pay more attention. <laughs> right. What were they good for? Well, like if we're talking about business, what, what yeah. did they do that really did help? Oh, they promoted the record. I mean, they, it was, and, and I, I got to hand it to them. They got you on radio. They got me on radio, and we yep. met like every one of their like uh, promotion uh, people in the field in all right. the different uh, mm. regions of the United States, and they were great. They were, they were all great. Right. 
They were like, well, come on, man, let's go. We're going to a radio station. We're going to get, you know, we're going to get 30 spins today. You know what I mean? They were just down to earth. And not that the yeah. label wasn't. I get it. I have nothing bad to say about labels. As I get older, you know, there's no right resentment or whatever. But they got us on the radio. They did what it took to get us they on the radio. They brought that asset to you. Yes, just absolutely. for the independent artists out there listening going, well, I wonder why, you know, should I get a label but, deal but saying today? That, or, saying right. that, that was after the 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 chance that you guys took and the belief that you guys had in your song. Yeah. You and know, then they, they went, okay, let's invest we'll some time this, into this yeah. and ride the wave. We, we had yep. to rub the sticks together and then they poured the gasoline. Right. And so that, that, yeah. that brings us to a good point about how it's, it's really the same today, if not 10 times more having to create that fire because back then – you didn't know how many Instagram followers you had, how many right. Facebook, how many YouTube. Yeah, because social media didn't exist. It, no, no, not at all. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't there. So that fire could have been 10 radio stations are playing you. We'll, we'll give you a shot. We'll inject some money. Right. Where now it's like, unless you've got over a million views. Yes, And yes. they can see everything. So that branding component today and that sort of the same thing. You need your internal team still working just as hard, yes, even yeah, when yes. the label's there, because they're they're invested into you, sure, but they want to see that you're still invested into you. Absolutely, you absolutely. Know, so. That should that should be a constant. Mm -hmm. If the band isn't excited and they just think, "Oh, I'm on a label now," we'll just sit back and kick our feet up and just let them do the, yeah, that. Yeah, that's work. not interesting for anyone. <laughs> yeah, that didn't work mm -hmm. in, in 1970, 80, 92, or whatever. You still, exactly. I mean. How do you not, anyway, as a band, as a as an artist, with that passion not, and right? Yeah, how do you just? Yeah. What can we do? What can we do? Let, let's do. You know, yeah, it, it, yeah. It's easy to yell. We got a record deal. We got a we got a contract. That is great, but still, what can There's we do? There's still work. There's yeah. still work to be done. It's, you, you're still building the business. Even if it's just, uh, you know, we're now. Yeah, you can have. A, if you got a four man band, you can. Everybody's going to be on their social media. Mm -hmm. But you know, for us, it was just like. Let's practice. Let's practice. Let's make our show. It's, our, our show was great, by the way, and it still is. That's one thing. I've, I've, I was raised in that school of practice, practice, take a lunch, and then practice some more and come back tomorrow and just wow. do the same thing. Yeah. And people used to be amazed. A couple of bands I was in, they were like, man, you guys are tight. How are you guys so good? I'm like, it's no secret. We practice longer than you do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You're practicing once a week. We're practicing twice a day. I mean, do the math. You know what I mean? And the same with you guys' business. You guys, you keep hammering away. Yeah. You know, the, the, the other companies that aren't hammering away, they're not getting as much success as you. It's like, what are you doing? Well, we're working harder. Mm -hmm. Same with bands, same with artists, same with singers. Hard and work, you get results. You do. Mm -hmm. yeah. You do. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, does that mean everybody's going to have a top 10 record? No. But no. it means that they're going to get to be the best that they can be. And get and the it, opportunity quicker to hear a yes or a no. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. At least if you get an answer, okay. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, we always had the mentality of let's go out and play, let's practice. We did a thousand interviews and we we loved it. We didn't look at it grudgingly. It was just like we were all old school, just like let's go out and play, let's plug in and play. Now if there was social media back then, oh mm -hmm. my goodness. Yeah. You could. You could have. Yeah. Well, Ellie, you did do you did you've done a lot of things right, but you did do a branding thing right. You authentically love a vast majority of different sounds. Yeah. And then you went and created a vast majority of different sounds. <laughs> right. So you can't argue that you didn't brand yourself correctly. Really? <laughs> okay. Right? Thank you. Thank you. So, oh, yeah. on a serious note, so August or September was is 25 years anniversary of Believe? Yeah. Yeah. O August? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, think it was, I think it actually went number one in like... Was it July? It was, yeah, July or August. Because uh, I remember we had played a big show and, uh, on my birthday in 95. And then from that show, we drove up to, where did we go? Buffalo. We went to Buffalo, New York. And on the ride up, we were listening to Casey Kasem. Counted down oh, wow. to number one. Yeah. Oh, it was just like you could hear a pin so, drop. In the, in so the that was 25 years ago. And given that we're still in this turmoil of racial inequality, mm -hmm. Did you think 25 years later, like your song had a massive impact and it was such straight to the point. You said the N word. To me these days, the N word's probably dirtier than it was back then mm, sure. to say. Sure. Do you feel like anything's changed in 25 years? And do you feel like you could say that word now? 
given that you're a black man as well, obviously. Sure. I mean, yeah, I think things have changed. I think, you know, I think they've changed and a lot of, I don't know how much the, you know, the needle has moved, but I think there, I think things have changed. And I, you know, I hate, you know, I use the term better, uh, very scarcely, but I think things have changed, but, uh, obviously they're never going to get to the point that, you know, we're all there. We've arrived. You know what I mean? There's always going to be problems. There's always going to be, there's always going to be that. And as far as saying that word now, when I go on stage next time the, the doors open up, I, I'm not going to shy away from it. Mm. You know, I'm not going to be politically cor- correct. Mm-hmm. Well, I feel... Uh, you know what I mean? I'm just... Yeah, like, I, I, I'm not going to... Yeah. You're, I, no, there you're, are, a, you're a black man. For me to say it's not right, but it's your song. You're right. a black man. You felt that and you, you're proud to say it. And that's... I'm going to no problems with that. Right. And But there are some shows that I don't say it. If, I, if, I'm, if we're doing a fair and I see a bunch of, you know, kids playing it, you know... I don't want to be the first person that they hear that word from. But if we had a regular concert, a theater, and it's grown-ups, whatever. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I'm not going to take – I've never had that in my mind, like, whatever. I shouldn't say it or whatever. Anyway, it just depends. It doesn't really, it cross, depends. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. really cross over. Yeah. Talking about the doors opening back up and getting back out on the road, what are the plans? What do you guys have? Are you starting to figure out what you're going to do in 2022? It may might be 2021 at this oh, point. Oh, I'll no, but... answer for you. I want Elliot to re-release. <laughs> <laughs> I believe and no, keep yes, going. No, no, really. I, seriously. I'm, I'm pushing. For, I, I, we've had these talks a couple oh, yeah. of times, but the, I guess the beautiful thing about I believe, and I guess there's also a little bit of a sad thing to it because this just keeps happening is that the song is always relevant yeah right yeah. it's such a powerful and relevant song all the time and obviously the world is going through a lot right now so now more than ever we 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 need to believe and always want love to find a way and you know we've kind of had some discussions about re-releasing and recutting mm-hmm. i believe with some some other uh current a-list acts so that's one thing i'll let you answer the rest yes no and that's you know and we want to get back out on the road and play i mean you know this band has always been a touring band i love to play you know uh, we've got a really good band we're gonna we're gonna just see how things happen hopefully sooner than later i don't know i can't predict what's gonna happen in 2021 right or even the rest of this year you know i was right though i mean whether i wrote this song or not you know, this is a message that people need to hear and not just hear it, but live it, mm. including myself. Look, we're, yeah. we're all works in progress. So we need to remind ourselves in certain situations that, wait a minute, OK, we're not going to we're not going to let the mercury rise here. You know, we can we can talk things out. We don't have to be violent about it. And let's remember what love is. Love is an action. Love is a verb. And we can love one another. I love everybody in here. And I'm going to treat you with love and respect. You know what I mean? So, But wh- you ask for it in return, too. I mean, it's, it's the well, way yeah, it should be. Yeah. 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 But, but you know, I believe that, you know, it's like, there's that word again. I keep saying that. <laughs> I believe you give love and you'll get it back or you got a better chance of getting it back. Right. So if yeah. everybody says it starts with me, me, everybody's saying that, then, wow, we're all... Well, and you can control you. You can't control the other person. If, exactly. You know, if you're sitting there waiting for the other person to treat you with love and respect while you're just like sitting in the corner, it's like, well, it's never, you know, right. not always so, going to happen. So given that COVID-19 has put a stop to all touring and that, how does that make you feel as a touring person? Are, were you a road dog for your early years and you had your family sort of calm down a little bit and you wanted to stay home? You know, I like this. Or were you just a road dog full time? No, it was, I mean, starting off, it was just like, th- that first record, we were on tour for like 18 months with like a week here, four days here. Nobody ever unpacked their suitcase, you know? <laughs> yeah. If you did, you unpacked, you washed your clothes, and you set it by the suitcase, you know what I mean? Because, yeah. you know, at any, I mean, we've been home from like a three-week trip, got home, took a shower, and no, we know we got at least three days off, and then we get a phone call. You don't have three days off. And that was cool with us. Mm. But as, you know, as we got older, kids started coming. I mean, you know, it, it, things just happen the way they happen. And you just want to be home with your kids more. You want to be home with your family more, whatever. And But at the same time, you know, you, you, know, you do what you got to do because you're in a band and this is what you signed up for. Mm. So nobody ever said, you know, we got a string of dates. Let's not do this tour. You know what I mean? Because we want to stay home. No, that, that really never really happened. What about now? Are you itching to get back out there? 
Yeah, somewhat in in a different light, in a different. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. There's a there's a sense of insecurity, like um, shit. Is it safe? Are, are the fans going to be safe? Uh, Logistics, are your crew going to be safe? Yeah, I mean, you, you kind of think about that. I mean, you want everybody to be safe. That's that's that come to see you. And that's working with you. You don't want anything bad to happen. But what I think the other thing, too, is you don't and this happens with a lot of brands that made it big, kind of plateaued a little bit, have some time off and then want to go again. You don't want to start where you started again. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 You you want to make sure that you reinvent yourself to the level where you left off. Yeah. Yeah. And so that can be a daunting process because you're like, well, I had all this success. I know exactly where we are and what we did and where we should be able to go. But I don't want to have to prove that again to you. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Exactly. So then to and it's like, how do we do that? Yeah. How and do that, we... that's a branding thing. That's a that's a informing, informing everybody. It's explaining that, hey, I have credibility. You might not have been around to see it, <laughs> but I got it. <laughs> right. Ask your mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ask your mom. Ring up your auntie. <laughs> it's there. So that's important to do as well. It's very important. Can you imagine yourself capturing a whole new audience? Because you just said, ask your, ask your mom how it was. You got this young generation coming up. Are they reachable with the music that's out there? I mean, with what you guys are doing, do you have something for them? I think so, because at the core of it, it may not, it may not get them right off, but it, you know, I believe was the same way. It was like you said, a mm. slow, slow build. I think if you listen to the message of the songs and, you know, we have just a plethora of songs with Bill (laughs) and Shay, I I think if they give it a shot, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a little different. I mean, my mother tried to get me into music that she was listening to. I was like, come on, I'm listening to Led Zeppelin. You know what I mean? But if I really listen to it, I'd be like, all right, yeah, it is pretty good. You know, did you listen to what your mom wanted you to listen to did you ever take an opportunity to listen uh, to yeah, a few things she liked uh curtis mayfield she liked uh atlanta rhythm section she liked donny hathaway donny hathaway is that who it was yeah. donny hathaway yeah. ray charles there was some ray charles records she liked some of the oldest tv one so yeah there were some similarities that she couldn't get into the black sabbath that i was into <laughs> i don't think any of our parents could so yeah <laughs> yeah there was you know it wasn't like Everything that she listened to, I didn't like. There were a lot of things that I did like, and I, I was like, yeah, I get this. You know what I mean? You know, then have your own thing that you grow up listening to, and it becomes a part mm. of who you are. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because it's just a different era. And same with now. So, yeah, the songs that we're going to come out with, and I'm curious to see. I don't overly think about it. I don't worry about it. I just think I'm naive still. But, I like but you're writing. That, you know? Yeah, definitely yeah. still writing. Yeah. We've got a whole album ready full of songs, but in the in that process, more songs are still being written. So and plus, uh, goodness gracious, on my phone, I mean, I've got folders full of ideas. It's just you just don't there's just not the time of day. It. I believe it. Folders full of <laughs> ideas, like, oh yeah. And sometimes when I'm writing with Bill and Shay, sometimes Sometimes I'll come with an idea and we'll write to that or somebody come with an idea. Sometimes we have nothing. We're just sitting there. <laughs> uh, we start writing something and it's not going anywhere. I go, well, wait a minute. Hold on. Look, I got this one thing and I've just hummed something to Bill and he just takes the baton and run, runs with it. And it's like it turns into something. Magic, yeah. So, yeah, I, there's never a shortage of that. Uh, it's, it's more about, you know, yeah, music and melody. I don't know. Some stuff. Some stuff comes to me quicker than others, and it takes me longer to write lyrics. Bill, Bill's like that. He's like boom, boom, boom. And sometimes I got to marinate on it. And we've written songs together. Talking about Bill DeLuigi. We've written songs together that we've done the lyrics, and then I lay the vocal, and I'm like, Ugh, you know, and I may go change a little bit here, and he'll be like, yeah, that's right. It just takes me a little longer because actually when they're coming out of my mouth, it's mm-hmm. just... Yeah, you're not paying attention like as if you were just sitting if, outside of yourself. Yeah, listening yeah. Listening to it, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, yes, there are songs. There's plenty, lots. Elliot, thank you so much. That's it? This was great. We're done? Yeah. Okay. You, you have to do you a session it. tonight. It's, so it's the wait. fastest hour. <laughs> you made it. <laughs> Rick, Melissa, thank you again. Thank, thank you, Bob. Rachel, thank you for arranging this. Thank this you, Tom. Wonderful. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Olivia. 
The Business Side of Music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The Business Side of Music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Fuson. You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.